there's so many points to cover here. Um, yes. I mean, you're basically talking your doppelganger dollars. I love the term uh, you call it. You say the Fed has created 2.7 trillion, brand new evil twin is what you call it, doppelganger dollars. A type of dollar that never existed before, a dollar that will haunt us for years to come. So basically, yeah. uh, at, the, at, the, at the culprit of the inflation we find ourselves in, and, and you have a great video uh, I think it's inflation explained in less than 40 seconds, um, where, where you say inflation is about basically the death of the currency, of currency going down, not prices going up. Exactly. As the, yeah, as they dilute, the, there's, there's only so many goods and services in a society that are for uh, sale at any time, things that you can pay people for and, and buy. And uh, then you've got the currency supply that facilitates uh, the transfer of true wealth, the, the stuff that exists in society, from one person to another over time and space. And, uh, and if you inflate the currency supply, if you double the currency supply, but you haven't doubled the number of goods and services that are available to buy with that currency supply, it's just like making uh, each unit of currency, you're diluting the currency supply, each unit of currency uh, has less purchasing power. It will store less. There's twice as many units of currency chasing after the same amount of goods and services. And this makes it a nightmare for businesses to keep up with the, with all, you know, it makes it a nightmare for people to try and get by. They suddenly find all these things being priced out of their grasp. Exactly. They need to ask for a raise. You ask for a raise, now the business isn't profitable. And on top of the raises, it's got to give its employees all of the prices of the, uh, the supplies, the, the, the rent that the business is paying, and, and if it's a restaurant, for instance, all of the food that it's buying, those things are going up. So it has to change its prices, which makes it more expensive for the average people like the employees that now need another raise. <laughs> and it's this never-ending cycle. And if we used real money, this is the thing that I, have, I started with my first book, was differentiating between money and fiat national currencies because the national currencies are not money and people need to start uh, differentiating these two things calling them by their proper names uh, money cannot store value because i mean currency cannot store value money does store value you, i've got um, a silver uh, pegasus coin on my desk that was minted in roughly 500 bc and if you melt it down, it still has purchasing power. Uh, the silver in it, the content, still has you know, roughly the same purchasing power as it would have had back then. They bounce up and down in a range, but, they, but precious metals are the only thing that have proven themselves over the centuries to be money, a store of value. If you go to the Federal Reserve's website or any other place and you look up the definitions of money, what are the attributes that money has to have? And even the Federal Reserve, the very first thing they say is it must be a store of value. And then they go on with the other things, a medium of exchange, a unit of account, and so forth. Uh, so a store of value is the most important thing. So if somebody thinks that the, their currency, their national fiat currency, the US dollar, the euro, the yen, the pound, whatever, if they think it's money and they tell you, no, 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 my, our currency is money, then ask them, does money need to be a store of value? Is that one of its functions? And they will say yes. Then ask them, is there inflation? <laughs> if they say yes, then ask them, aren't those two things mutually exclusive? <laughs> if, it's a, if it's storing value, how come prices are going up and, and it's buying less the next day, the next year? Uh, and uh, the way currency is borrowed into existence, national fiat currencies, uh, they have to lose value. It is not possible for them to maintain their purchasing power over long periods of time. And it's just a function of the math behind borrowing currency into existence and promising to pay it back plus interest. And the currency to pay the interest doesn't exist yet. You have to borrow that in the future. So, so let me, I usually save, um, you know, what should we be doing for the last part of the interview, but I feel that I need to ask it now. Uh, because, you know, if we can't change what central banks are going to do next, if we don't obviously have control over that, over the system, 
you know, what I'm hearing from you is like, what can we do for ourselves? Are, are you suggesting to own the, the, the bulk of your wealth in precious metals? Well, that's what I do. Uh, I know that, you know, the world's central banks have been net buyers of precious metals for, of, of gold for quite a while now. And last year was a record that goes back to what, 1968, I believe was the right. last time. All, and, all time, actually, they, re, they adjusted it. Time. They came back, the World Gold Council came back and said it was actually the highest bought ever on record. Doesn't that say to you that the central yes. banks that are doing the purchasing know that something <laughs> is up and they're getting That's ready for something That's what I've been saying. Big. Right. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So um, yeah, something big is coming. I'm getting ready for it. And the thing is, you know, I wish I could have come up with a different title other than uh, Great Gold and Silver Rush of the 21st Century. But I believe this is going to be the biggest gold rush in history. The amount of currency that has been created, the amount of true wealth that exists, and then all of that suddenly trying to seek a safe haven uh, during periods of turbulence, which we are going into right now. And gold and silver have been suppressed. And some of the people that suppressed, <laughs> you know, there's been convictions uh, of people that were accused of manipulating the price of gold. Now, these are more short-term manipulations, but long-term manipulations have existed as well. But uh, in one chapter, uh, to those people, you know, I, I say that the manipulations have allowed me to accumulate gold at a lower price than it would have been if the free market was setting the price. And I say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Enjoy your time in jail. <laughs> let me ask you, let me go out on a limb and ask this question. If the central banks are desperate to, to hoard gold or whatever for, for whatever they see coming, um, yeah. and, and you, you bring up that gold is, you know, right now we can argue should be much higher than what it is, and you, you bring up, you know, price suppression, can we make a link there? I mean, don't central banks want to keep gold prices lower if they're buying? Yes, they do want to keep prices lower. What was interesting, there's one little piece. During the pandemic, there were huge amounts of gold flowing into the United States. Normally, the United States is an exporter of gold, not an importer. And uh, the COMEX was getting prepared for They didn't want to face some sort of default. And if you look at that period of time, if you take um, the uh, central bank purchases from China, uh, plus uh, the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and you look at the inflows and outflows, China was accumulating, the, there were inflows. When you look at their exchanges and the central bank purchases, the central bank purchases, they only report once in a while. And I think they're actually accumulating more than they're admitting. Uh, but the uh, China's uh, constant importation of gold stopped, as well did the rest of the world. And it was like suddenly, all the gold was flowing to the United States to prevent some sort of uh, default. And um, so it seems like there is something very big going on beneath the surface here.